Uh, welcome to this course on uh, Bayes and AI. And uh, let me just start that uh, there's a book that uh, goes along with this course, uh, AIQ, uh, a book I wrote with a good friend and co-author of mine, James Scott. Uh, so please, please read the book. Uh, the book is essentially seven chapters and gives seven uh, AI IQ stories. Uh, and you'll see these throughout the course as well. Okay, so week one. We're going to talk about probability and Bayes. We'll directly get to look at Bayes' rule. So let me first of all review some very basic probability concepts that uh, you should all be familiar with. And the idea behind probability is it lets us talk efficiently about things that we're uncertain about. So, for example, predicting Amazon's next sales next quarter, uh, trying to understand the, the returns on my, on my uh, stock portfolio, uh, or trying to figure out what's the probability uh, that somebody would click through on a particular, say, Google ad. And when building these uh, or trying to assess these probabilities, you build what's known as probability models. Uh, and all such things require uh, a data set, uh, a model, and estimating and predicting unknowns. And how do we deal with unknowns? Well, we model those with something called a random variable. And my typical notation for a random variable will be a capital X. So random variables are numbers you're not sure about. Uh, you will typically get to observe them, uh, and then you'll get to try and figure out what you want to figure out given what you've observed. And that's really the sort of the Bayesian or Bayesian learning part of the problem. So there'll be a list of possible outcomes, and you'll assign probabilities to each outcome. So, for example, you'll see me talk about probability distributions where little x is the outcome and big X is the random variable. And we'll start to talk about quantities, for example, like what's the probability that x equals x uh, or what's the probability that x is less than or equal to x. And the three uh, distributions that you'll learn in this week are sort of the three building blocks. We'll learn about the binomial uh, that's the coin tossing example that's above. Uh, we'll learn about our good friend the normal or Gaussian or bell-shaped distribution. Uh, and we'll learn about another distribution for count, something called a Poisson distribution. Okay. Uh, first of all, how should one think about probability? And there's a long history of this, and I'll talk in a second about uh, uh, the historical view of probability and, uh, if you like, which side of the coin that you lie on, whether you believe in objective probability or, or subjective probability. And so as, I've, as we've already said, probability is a language designed uh, to help us communicate about uncertainty. And it'll be a number between zero to one, measuring how likely that event is to occur. And hopefully by the end of this course, you realize it's immensely useful and really the foundation of artificial intelligence uh, and algorithms and machine learning as well. Uh, Komogorov uh, was one of the first people to lay out basic rules. So a rules-based approach to probability would be something like this. Uh, so we're going to talk about events. So tossing a coin, for example, heads or tails. Now, if the event is certain to occur, uh, we'll have probability 100% of that event happening. Uh, either an event A occurs or it does not, uh, so as all probabilities have to sum to 1, we're going to have to have probability of A is equal to 1 minus probability of not A. Again, a very simple basic rule. Uh, although, when you come to assess probabilities, sometimes it's good to take the other side of the argument or the other side of the coin and try and figure out, okay, I want to work out probability of A. Maybe it's easier for me to calculate the probability of not A. Uh, and we'll see a couple of examples of that. Uh, and then there's an additivative rule. If two events are mutually exclusive, so they both can't occur simultaneously, then the chance of A or B is equal to the, just the sum of the probabilities, chance of A plus chance of B. Now, the, the fourth is really the one that uh, has some meat to it, and this will, this will uh, again be the uh, beginning of Bayes' rule. If two events are independent, so the fact I know that one event happens doesn't change my beliefs about the probability of another event. 
I'll have probability of A and B is equal just to the, to the multiplication of the probabilities, P of A times P of B. Okay, so this is really a Kolmogorov uh, was really one of the first people in the 1930s to axiomatize probability. Now, of course, let me just give you a little bit of a historical aside. Uh, I prefer the Bayes-Laplace approach to probability, uh, which also taken up by somebody called Dafinetti and somebody called Ramsey. So what do I mean by that? So rather than thinking of probability as just some objective number common to all individuals, uh, I see probability as a subjective number. Uh, individuals can, can argue about their different probabilities of events. Now, of course, if you take the subjective approach, and a simple way of thinking about that is, you can think about whether the event A occurs or doesn't occur, and you can think about winning a dollar or losing a dollar if, if A occurs or doesn't occur. And P of A is just your willingness to bet. How much are you willing to bet today to enter into that, into, to enter into that transaction? So for example, if I'm tossing a coin and I thought it was 50-50, uh, essentially I would think my probability of A is 0.5. I'm willing to bet 50 cents, I'll, I'll get a dollar if it comes up heads and I'll, I'll lose my 50 cents if it comes up tails. Now, at, at some level, that's also quite simplistic. It doesn't take into account uh, utility uh, of money. So, for example, if these if these sums were way bigger than a dollar, uh, I would also have to take into account probability. Uh, but one simple way of thinking about probability, the subjective approach, is just your willingness to bet. And Dafinetti and Ramsey's approach was, rather than listing out axioms, uh, like Kolmogorov did, uh, they believed in something called the principle of coherence. So the principle of, of uh, coherence. And all that meant was you could have what, whatever probabilities you, 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 you want to have. But your list of probabilities you give for, for bets uh, must avoid sure loss. So if somebody was betting against you, you can't set up a list of probabilities where they could construct a bet that no matter what happened, uh, that they would win money from you. And rather interestingly, this principle of coherence idea, you can then deduce from that the list of probabilities, uh, the Kolmogorov axioms. So that's really the subjective approach to probability. Uh, Dafinetti, Ramsey, and then later uh, von Neumann, Savage, uh, and people like that. Uh, now, the more objective, where probability is just a, a given quantity like mass of a certain thing, uh, you have a lot more difficulty measuring that, right? It's not a subjective belief of how much you're willing to bet. Uh, so typically to operationalize that, you have to imagine uh, repeating the experiment 10,000 times, say, and counting up the number of times that A occurred. And to a subjectivist, this objective approach really isn't that operational. I don't really want to, I don't really want to toss my coin 10,000 times to find out what's going to happen. And then some events like a horse race or like a, uh, like a football game, you, you're only really ever going to have one uh, uh, one time the event gets played. So objective versus subjective. So there's a little bit of, of history for you. Okay, uh, remember remember number four, and when we get to Bayes' rule, we'll, we'll go a little bit further. We'll look to see, hey, what happens to number four when events are not independent? And again, you know, just an incredibly simple uh, example just to get us going. Remember, we talked about random variables and outcomes so suppose I, I get to toss two coins and I just count up the number of heads. This is going to be a simple binomial distribution. So we're going to write this as binomial where n is equal to 2, I've tossed it twice, and where p is equal to 0.5, I'm tossing a fair coin. And I'm going to just count up the number of heads. Uh, so for example, I could get two tails, probably do half a half, I could get head tail or tail head, so a quarter plus a quarter, I get a half, or I get two heads with, with probability a uh, quarter. And again, as we said before, this is what's known as a discrete random variable. So it takes uh, a list of possible values. So I can talk about things, what's the chance that x is equal to zero, or I could talk about chance, you know, what's the x chance that x is greater than or equal to one. And of course, that would just be one minus, remember our, our second axiom, that would just be one minus the probability that 
x is equal to 0. So these would be just 1 quarter from the table above, and then just uh, 3 quarters. So simple probability distributions. OK, you know, how, would I, how would I use probability? So let, let, let me just do uh, a sort of sports betting, sports analytic type example, and looking at streaks, uh, winning streaks. So Pete Rose is a very famous uh, baseball player, uh, played for the Cincinnati Reds, uh, and he had a hitting streak of 44 consecutive games. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, I have to have some assessment of what's the probability uh, that Pete Rose will, will get a hit. Uh, and by that, I mean to get to first base or better. And so just historically, if I looked at, sometimes I'll look at P with a hat, meaning I've looked at an empirical probability, uh, basically 30% of the time he would generally get a hit. And then I have to, to figure out, okay, each game he plays, uh, how many times he typically play, uh, typically bad, typically four. And the interesting question is, well, what's the probability of hitting safely? Uh, and by hitting safely, I mean he, had, he, he gets to first base at least once in uh, one of the games. So he had a, he had a, a streak of 44. Oh, and then at the very end of this, of this little analysis, uh, we'll look at Joe DiMaggio. Uh, actually, chapter I think chapter uh, six of the uh, AIQ book uh, talks about hitting streaks, and uh, we talk about Joe DiMaggio in there. Uh, the record is 56, and that's still held. And uh, Joe DiMaggio's P hat or or empirical probability of hitting was was 0.325, slightly higher than Pete Rose. So we'll try and figure out what happens uh, when you when you look at Joe DiMaggio. But how likely is this is this event to happen? And you know it's a remarkable thing. So it's going to have a low probability. Now, as as with any probability model, as we will call them, uh, assumptions will be made, and and sometimes assumptions uh, are, are really just approximations to what's going on in the real world. So just so we can do the calculation, uh, I'll assume that each at bat is independent. Uh, now, with modern day uh, collection of data and baseball data, we can actually physically go in and, and check to see how independent these things are. Uh, the hot hand is uh, an, another big literature uh, that, that people have studied. That, you know, once, once a really good sportsman starts to play well, there tends to be a tendency for him to keep on playing well. So uh, I'm going to make an, an independence assumption, but uh, but with bigger and bigger data sets and finer and finer data and finer and finer probability models, uh, we can actually go a little bit further and, uh, and try and assess, uh, assess these other such things like hot hands. Okay, so very quickly, uh, how would I use those basic Kolmogorov axioms to figure out what's the odds of him hitting safely in, in 44 games? Well, first of all, with all these probability problems set up some notation, what's the underlying event? AI is the event that Pete Rose hits safely in the eighth game. I want, I want to compound up 44 of those, and I'm assuming independence. So my independence assumption lets me, uh, lets me uh, use that rule four, and essentially I'm producting up probability. So I want, what's the chance of A1 and A2 all the way down to and A44? And again, let me use that, that second axiom too. Uh, what's the chance of hitting safely uh, in a game? That means he gets to, to first base at least once. Well, it's much easier to work out the chance of him not hitting safely in the game, getting four strikeouts, and then just doing one minus that. So let me just take one of the events. The chance of hitting safely in game one is one minus the chance he makes four strikeouts. What's the chance of getting struck out? Well, 0 0.7, that's just the one. Remember, he's a 300 hitter. So that's just one minus 0.3. So the chance of him hitting safely in one game is about 76%, essentially three times out of four. And I do this, or well, his winning streak was, uh, was a sequence of 44, and so you can see uh, there's an incredibly small probability. Uh, what, five zeros, five seven. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, before he began his streak, if you wanted to try and put odds on that happening, uh, it would be about 175,470 to 1. Uh, one point to make is the probability of an event is related to odds of an event uh, with the following two formulas. 
the odds of an event is essentially the probability of it not happening over the probability of it happening. And if I, if I substitute out, essentially the probability is 1 over 1 plus the odds. So if I had a 50-50 bet, my odds were 1 to 1. That just means the probability is a half. Uh, if I had odds of 2 to 1, so that means if I bet $1, I'll win $2, I get my dollar back as well, so I'll get $3 back. But uh, So if my odds are 2 to 1, essentially the underlying probability of the event would be one third. And you see up here that for the Pete Rose sequence, uh, if I'd bet a dollar, I'd be getting $175,000 for 70 to 1 back. So if I really could foresee uh, that streak of 44. And just another couple of other little facts. Uh, the law of very large numbers is interesting. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of baseball games in a year. Doesn't mean that the run of 44 won't be beaten by some player at some time in the future. Uh, that's just the law of very large numbers. Uh, in some sense, uh, it, it would happen just according to the underlying frequency that it, that it should happen, right? And just quickly back to Joe DiMaggio. Uh, Joe DiMaggio was a 0 0.325 hitter. So the 0.7 uh, is odds of hitting safely in a game is is now a 79.2%, more like four times out of the f more like four times out of five. And of course, his incredible record of 56, which no one's really gotten close. Uh, and I'm sure the baseball experts will can can talk about uh, you know why why it's now become hard hard to get there uh, would be basically two times ten to the minus six would be uh, uh, would be even higher odds essentially uh, essentially yes, around about five hundred thousand to one okay uh, one other other quick example uh, so as I said you. You should try and get good at assessing probabilities of things. So when you see something in reality, when you see an outcome in reality, you should just step back and say, "Well, you know, what 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 were the odds of uh, of that, or what was the probability of that happening ahead of time?" Uh, and we'll come back to this example. So I've just got it here. Uh, again, it's another example of a binomial. Uh, and so, just an interesting fact. Uh, the Patriots in the 2014-2015 season won 19 out of 25 coin tosses. And of course, if the coin was fair, 50-50, uh, you'd expect what 12 and a half would be. Uh, uh, so 19 is quite a bit bigger than, than the 12. And so you'd like to think to yourself, you know, what's, the, what's, the, what's actually the probability of that happening? It's an unlikely event. How unlikely was it that that would happen? And if I set it up in random variable space, uh, I'm basically counting uh, the uh, the number of successes. So again, it's a binomial distribution. So let x be uh, what if the Patriots win zero otherwise, and then let let uh, let me look at the sum over 25. And if it really was 50-50, chance x is one is a half. Now to do our binomial probability, uh, so the total sum uh, is going to be binomial with n is equal to 25, p is equal to p is equal to 0.5. And I want to say what's the chance here uh, that x is equal to equal to 19. And you'll see that uh, there's a formula for the binomial uh, probabilities. Uh, let me sort of go backwards. First of all, some particular sequence will turn up, right, of heads of, uh, of heads and tails. And if the coin is fair, so 50-50 to begin with, each possible sequence has just got probability of happening one half to the power of 25. The difficult bit, of course, is how many possible sequences are there that actually lead to your outcome. And so in binomial terms, uh, I need to know how many ways are there of choosing 19 out of 25, and there's a formula for that, so it's called 25 choose 19. Essentially 25 factorial over 19 factorial times 6 factorial. So uh, there's a the binomial formula and essentially there's about 177,100 different sequences. And so if I pull everything together and count up uh, essentially I get basically a probability of it was unlikely. If it really was a fair coin that was a pretty unlikely event. That, that odds of that happening ahead of time uh, would have been one in uh, one in two thousand. Okay, we'll 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 come back to that example 
later as well. Okay, so here's, here's three concepts that are important. So uh, conditional, joint, and marginal distributions. Uh, so typically I've got two random variables, x and y. The joint probabilities, what's the chance that x equals x and y equals y? The most important one for us is really the conditional probability. Uh, this is going to be the, the foundation of Bayes. Uh, can I really assess what's the chance x equals x given that y is equal to y? So you read the bar there as given. And Bayes is all about observing information and updating your beliefs or probabilities in light of new data. Uh, and so sometimes people call it Bayesian learning. Uh, and so it's a very powerful uh, set of techniques for understanding how probabilities change in time as the, as the uh, state of the system changes around you or as you learn new information. And there's something called the marginal probability is if I just look at one of the variables on its own. And actually, in some sense, these things are not mutually exclusive. You can have a marginal probabilities from conditional probabilities and, and as such. So uh, when you've got multiple random variables. So three, three concepts, joint, conditional, and marginal. If I put it in, in, uh, in mathematical terms uh, with slightly uh, more succinct notation, uh, the, what's the chance x equals x, y equals y? One of two things could happen, right? Either x happens first with probability p of x, and then y happens given that x happens. Or I could think of y happening with probability p of y, and then x happens given, given y. So there's actually two different ways of factorizing the joint, and those two must be equal. And if I if I put those two equal, essentially I'm going to be getting uh, I'm going to be getting base rule. So p of y given x, sorry p of x given y is p of y given x times p of x over p of y. That's just me putting these two equal and solving out for p of x given y. And you know that's maybe one of the the most powerful. Uh, uh, and really one of the only few rules that you really need to know about probability. Uh, and what's the relationship between marginals and joints? The marginal just gets from summing out uh, uh, the other variables. So if I take that, uh, take that joint probability table, and you'll see one in a minute, I just sum over y. Okay, so remember, remember Bayes' rule. Uh, one of my friends, J.B. Heaton, has always told me that one of the one of the nicest things I did to him was was uh, teach him about uh, Bayes' rule. So uh, once you once you've learned it, you tend to see it everywhere uh, everywhere in life. So okay, very quick uh, example. Maybe uh, you should do this one at home. Uh, two variables, salary and happiness. Uh, you want to know, given that you have a high salary, uh, what's the chance that you're happy? And you'd like to know. Is that bigger than just the marginal, the overall incidence of you being happy, of you being happy? So someone's taken a big survey and created this probability table. And from this, uh, you would essentially sum up uh, and calculate all the marginal distributions. So uh, I'll start and do one up here, and then you can fill in the other one. So uh, let me do the marginal distribution down here of the x variable, p of x. So point. 0 0.3, 0 0.12, 0 0.07, 0 0.22. Uh, the next one is 0 0.26. Uh, the next one is what? 0 0.28. And the last one's 0 0.24. And if I've done my math correctly, uh, if I sum up the total, total probability is equal to 1. Oh, and then, you know, hopefully you've been, been following along. Let me just do the do the marginal distribution for y on the other side, uh, 0 0.07, uh, 25, 38, 0 0.47, 0 0.46. And again, if I if I if I add them up, I should get to one. So from my joint distribution, this is just my, my table of p of x and y. I can get my I can get my two marginal distributions, p of y and p of x. And how would I do something like p of y equals two? Uh, well, what's what's the chance I'm happy? That's essentially the the forty six percent. And then 
if I want to do the conditional probability, the Bayes calculation, given that x is equal to 3. And so the way I like to think of this is that I just imagine myself in this box here. So I'm conditioning myself to this box. I now want to know uh, what's the chance that I'm happy. So essentially, I get to renormalize the probability rate. I get to look at the 0.14 over the 0.24. And I think that's around about 58%. And so the answer to the question is yes. Uh, if I have a high salary, the odds of me being happy is 58. Uh, my underlying marginal or sometimes base rate probability is 46. OK, so conditional, marginal, and joint distributions uh, dealing with probabilities. Let me just quickly go back to independence. Uh, you know, most things in life are not independent. Uh, but independence is just this condition that no matter what you see in x, it doesn't affect your probabilities for y. So there's no Bayesian learning if I, if I have independence. Knowing x equals x tells you nothing about y. And so, you know, the standard basic coin toss model would be, would be that, right? What's the probability of getting ahead in the second toss, given I saw a tail in the first one? It shouldn't really depend. And so you'd, uh, uh, you'd think that the probability of ahead would still just be a half. So... Even if you saw a sequence of heads in a row and you wanted to guess the next one, uh, you should still think it's a 50-50 bet. Uh, or given a sequence of, of tails in a row, uh, what's the next one? You should still think it's a 50-50 bet. And, you know, lots of Kahneman and Tversky uh, were famous for, uh, uh, for studying how humans react to empirical data. So there's a, a big literature on behavioral probability too that I won't talk too much about. But uh, as a little bit of a tendency, uh, humans would, after they've seen a whole string of tails, seem to think that heads are due. Uh, and most would say there's more than a 50-50 chance of heads being true. Now, all of these, all of these problems are very subtle. Uh, the, head hand, the, the hot hand problem is, you know, someone like Steph Curry has scored you know, 10 three-point shots in a row, what's the odds of him hitting, hitting the next one? Uh, you know, it's a much harder question, right? And we, we'd have to look at uh, a large, big empirical data set and uh, figure out a little bit more carefully, well, how would I really assess the odds of, of, of him hitting another three-pointer? Okay, so there's some interesting, uh, very interesting to see what the mathematics would say and interesting to see how, how the behavior, how humans react to these things as well, another, another huge field. Okay, so let's, let's go back to Bayes' rule. Remember, maybe, you know, the most important uh, uh, theorem or fact about probability that you should know, and you should, you should all, be, all try and get good at, good at using it. Uh, week two of the course, there'll be a lot more examples of Bayes' rule, so it's uh, not going away for a while, so uh, let's, let's make sure that we, we figure out what's going on. So... Suppose I want to try and figure out the odds of x given y. Somebody tells me that, that, that y has happened. How do I change my beliefs about x? And the computation of p of x given y will come from what I initially believed. So sometimes people will call that your prior probability. And what I believed about the odds of y happening given that x has happened. And we saw a couple of slides ago. Uh, I can essentially write p of x given y is p of y, y and x, the joint divided by the marginal on y. The marginal on y can be written as a sum over x of the joint of y and x. And the top one can be written as reversing the conditioning, p of y given x times times p of, y, p of x. So you can see that if I just know these two terms on the, on the right-hand side, if I know my initial prior beliefs, and if I know what's known as uh, the likelihood of, of uh, really, it's just a probability, probability of y given x. And then I normalize it. Uh, essentially, the, the denominator is uh, equal to p of y. I can essentially get to, to Bayes' rule. And sometimes that denominator calculation uh, is called the law of total probability. Actually, rather interestingly, uh, Keynes's first book, or one of his first books, was called A Treatise on Probability around about 1914. So Keynes was one of the first people to, uh, to look at Bayes' rule. Uh, and of course, before him, 
uh, Laplace and Bayes. So if you want to uh, want to get some uh, historical view on, on Bayes, Bayes updating and Bayes learning. And so by learning, all people really mean is I start with probability P of X, I see Y, what's my new probability P of X given Y. Uh, so Bayes' rule is, is an incredibly useful tool for working out conditional probabilities. And you'll typically be given all these quantities on the right-hand side, and it's just a calculation problem to get to the left. Now, here's, here's a good example to, to keep, and a very important example to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, P of X given Y is generally very different from P of Y given X. And so one thing I used to like to tell my son when he was young, uh, the probability of you playing in the NBA given that you practice hard is pretty close to zero. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of people in, in, in the world that practice hard and very few people that get to play in the NBA. Now, other way around, given that you play in the NBA, the probability you practice hard is, is, is typically quite close to one. I'm sure most NBA players uh, you know, practice incredibly hard. And so there's a big difference between P of X given Y and P of Y given X. And as, it, as you, know, you know, us humans, uh, we tend to get the wrong conditioning. We tend, to, we tend to calculate. So it's very important to ask the right question. What conditional probability do you actually need to, you know, need to work out? So what conditional? It makes a big difference. Do you need? And all roads will would lead to you using Bayes rule. And you know why is why is why is there such a big difference? Well, it's generally because because the initial, if you like, baseline prior, the prior probability of playing in the NBA is close to zero. Remember Bayes rule: probability of playing in the NBA given practice hard is probability of practice hard given play in the NBA. Probability of playing in the NBA over the probability of practice hard. So uh, these two are related by Bayes rule. And really why this one's close to zero is because the initial prior probability when I plug it into Bayes rule is, uh, is pretty close to zero. Uh, I like to do these, when you, when you go through the course, uh, you'll see I like to do these very quick one slide examples. Uh, you can go into a lot more depth. Uh, Google, uh, Wikipedia has a lot more information on these, on these things. So you know, I really suggest that uh, you go away and study and study these things. Uh, so, you know, one of the one of the more interesting uh, examples of independence versus Bayes in in the court of law was uh, a very sad case of somebody called Sally Clark, which if you go to Wikipedia, you can find that, find out about her. Uh, unfortunately, her two babies both died of cot death or sudden in, sudden infant death syndrome, and the uh, probabilistic experts. Uh, we're trying to figure out well, what was the odds of that happening and trying to figure out whether she was guilty guilty of murder or not and there was no other evidence just the fact that her, her two young children died of died of cot death and so the experts uh, if you just use independence uh, the initial underlying base rate probability of dying of cot death is 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 uh, you know low but I would say much higher than I would have thought it's about one in eight thousand five hundred and of course, if, if, if two, if you used independence, you'd get to this incredibly low probability of one in 73 million. And it would sort of look as if, uh, as if the person was guilty, you know, such an incredibly low event, uh, maybe, you know, something incredibly surprising, maybe they're guilty of murder, right? Now, under Bayes, uh, it turns out there's a genetic component to uh, to cot death and you know if you again if you go to the web uh, lots of these probabilities are affected by genetics uh, one of my students Giovanni Parmigiani worked on uh, the probabilities for BRCA1 uh, the BRCA gene for breast cancer for example and uh, again you know most things will, will have a genetic component and it'll affect your probabilities and so if we just do a, a, a more a more detailed base calculation uh, that odds of the second one is not 
the 1 in 8,500, it's only 1 in 100. And so the 1 in 73 million comes down to 1 in 850,000. Still a low probability. Uh, but Sally Clark lived in London. Uh, you know, London's a big city with like 10 million people. So if you think of it as how, how many cases would you, would you see in a city like London? When in a city of 10 million, with an odds of something happening of one in eight hundred and fifty thousand, it's you know you would expect to see uh, expect to see that event happening as opposed to the the one up top. So uh, you know it's a big difference, and as a general rule, uh, I think most of us would uh, would acquit the person even though it's a low probability. Uh, huge difference between independence and and base. Okay, so the next uh, the next concept, uh, and again, I'll go through these concepts quickly, expectation variance, covariance, and then we'll get to our probability distributions, we'll get to our binomial, our normal, and our Poisson. So how do I work out an expected value of a random variable? Simply the weighted average of possible outcomes of X. So if I know the list of probabilities, uh, and so that's an assumption, I don't always know my list of probabilities, I'll just weight the outcome x, I'll sum over all possible values, and I get my expected value of x. Now, maybe I should put a little hat here. Uh, if I don't know my list of probabilities, I'll collect, a, I'll collect an empirical data set. So what's an empirical way of uh, calculating expected values? I'll just observe uh, empirically each uh, the empirical distribution, uh, probability one upon n of each possible outcome, and then I'll just wait again, and I'll work out the empirical mean, or, or sometimes just called the sample mean, little x bar. So this is a very standard statistical. Uh, so this is this is really sort of the basics of statistics. Is uh, I don't really know the probabilities, but I can observe reality. I can look at an empirical data set and I can calculate the empirical mean. And there's a lot of, of statistical theory that tells us uh, how close will the sample mean be to the true theoretical mean expected value of x. Uh, and in the world of big data and a huge amount of uh, uh, much easier and, and, and less costly to collect data, uh, we can do a lot more of these studies and just calculate, calculate what's known as x bar, uh, the empirical mean. Very useful idea. And so, uh, just as we do expected values, we can also calculate things like expected values of x squared. Uh, so that'll get us to variances. Uh, let me just be a little bit more specific. A variable is a, is a, is a random variable. Uh, so there's two identical definitions. Variance is just what's the expected squared different or squared deviations from the mean. Uh, or I can calculate variance as expected value of x squared minus expected value of x all squared. Now, variance is not in the same same units as the underlying random variable x, so I'll typically work out standard deviation, the square root of the variance. So when I'm trying to describe a random variable, the first two concepts that will come to mind will be its mean and its standard deviation. Uh, there's what's known as higher order moments, something called the skewedness, the third moment, ketosis fourth moment as well. So if I want to try and understand the behavior of a random variable. Uh, here's a very simple uh, simple example, uh, but it's it's a good one. Uh, who wins who wins the running race? Is it the tortoise or the or the hare? So a tortoise and hare are selling cars. I give an incredibly simple probability distribution. The tortoise sells either one or two cars a day with 50-50 probability the hair cells either zero or three. And again, this is just to illustrate that on average, uh, they both sell the same, but of course the variance of tortoise is way less than the variance of hair. Uh, so on standard deviation scale, one third of, one third of that. And there's a, a similar idea, we'll, we'll, we'll look at a uh, stock market example, a similar idea in the stock market of I have highly volatile stocks, not so volatile stocks. Who's gonna Who's gonna get to the winning post first? You know, how do I How do I proportion my assets across 
across risk is sort of an, an old an old famous problem. Uh, how how do you calculate those numbers? Uh, I won't do the details. Uh, again, I'm just implementing the formulas for expected value and variance. So uh, I let you I let you have a go at checking those. Uh, there's the formula for tortoise and for hare. Uh, now, typically, what does it mean for long run behavior? Uh, well, as a general rule, uh, and as I said in, in the stock market example, uh, Markovitz was the uh, person that, that the first sort of looked at this, uh, particularly when you have compounding. Uh, given given two equal opportunities, uh, you, you you sort of want to avoid risk if you can. Uh, so you'd want to pick uh, the one with the lower variance. Uh, the lower variance is just more predictable and uh, and will compound better. So uh, you know risk exists in the world, and probability has been really one of the the sole tools to uh, uh, to, to deal with risk. Uh, there's a very good book by somebody called Peter Bernstein. Uh, talking about uh, probability and risk over the ages uh, and its relationship to finance. And, you know, doing your best to tame risk, uh, you know, if you're given two equal opportunities, it, it typically doesn't benefit you to take, to take the higher variance when you might want to pick the lower variance. The question, of course, is, you know, how do I actually figure out, uh, you know, predicting uh, what the opportunity you set is, predicting uh, what the means and variances are, not as, not as simple as you would have thought. Okay, so just quickly two more concepts, uh, covariance and correlation. Uh, covariance you'll see as a theoretical concept, correlation is essentially standardized covariance and is much easier to interpret. So covariance is just given by uh, the expected value of x minus its mean times y minus its mean. Uh, again, if I know the probabilities, uh, I can actually calculate it. Uh, otherwise, if I don't, I just use empirical, uh, just like just like we used x bar. I would do the same empirical. We'd do uh, x i minus x bar, y i minus y bar, uh, summed up over over my observations. So I can empirically estimate covariance. Uh, you know. We'll get to regression when I've got two variables. Uh, covariance and correlation doesn't uh, doesn't always always tell you that much. Uh, here's just a couple of little plots: volatility index against uh, the level of the S and P index, the level of Apple stock uh, against uh, the level of the S and P index, and really for for covariance correlation, which is foundation of regression, you really want sort of straight lines in these things. Uh, now you can see that with uh, with volatility in the level of the S&P, uh, you don't really have a single line. Uh, and, even, and even with the Apple one, uh, you sort of have two clusters. Now again, transforming variables, which is a, a very important thing. So instead of looking at price levels, I could look at returns to Apple and returns to the S&P. And you'll see that I get a much, uh, a much more sensible straight line. So uh, you know, covariance correlation not not uh, not always not always the fundamental tool to look at. Uh, let me just give you the definition of correlation. Remember, I you know standardized covariance. You take the covariance between two random variables, divide by the product of the two standard deviations, so it normalizes it uh, to essentially lie between minus one and one. And again, the units uh, of x and y don't really affect. Uh, correlation. Uh, <clears throat> in the plus one case, I've got a perfect straight line. In the minus one case, uh, I don't. Uh, but again, there can be there can be issues with correlation. So, for example, uh, if I if I look at uh, the quadratic y equals x squared, if I just plotted y equals x squared, uh, you'd see that the uh, correlation between the the two was a zero. But clearly, there's a clearly there's a relationship. So. Really, really, covariance correlation is not designed to pick up nonlinear effects, but uh, it's such a it's such a basic tool for understanding how two variables move together that you know it's got a it's got a big uh, a big place in statistical theory. And again, in a super super simple example, 
if I give you things on the right hand side, I can calculate correlation on the left hand side. Now, just as just as Bayes' rule is maybe the most important rule to learn in probability, uh, the two most important rules to learn for for how expectations and variances move uh, are these linear combinations of random variables. So. You know, I like to think of this in stock market terms. X and Y are returns on two stocks, your two favorite stocks, maybe Google and Facebook. And A and B is how much money I put into each stock. So uh, if I put half my money into Google, half my money into Facebook, I get 50-50. Now, in terms of the expected value, there's not a lot, there's not a lot that, that, uh, that statistics and probability theory can do for you, right? If I, if I, if I cut my portfolio between two things I like, I'm just going to get the average of the returns of the individuals. There's nothing, nothing extra uh, that I can get out of it. And so again, this is this is the Markowitz diversification uh, type uh, type idea. Uh, what can I get out of it? Well, I can just hopefully change the risk characteristics. So uh, you'll see people use this as a basis of diversification. And the basis of of, of Markowitz, uh, what's I think his book is called Portfolio Selection. And the in, the insight here is that how variable will be my combination? Well, variance squares things, so I'll get a squared times the variance of x plus b squared times the variance of y. The interesting thing is I get the covariance term. And if I'm if I'm incredibly lucky. And this covariance term is negative or small, I can get a I can get a dramatic reduction uh, in variance by 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 cutting up my assets. So the whole idea behind cutting up your assets is that in theory uh, you're trying to gain from this variance covariance. Uh, so I'd love to find assets that really that really have a very low covariance. So. Uh, negative covariance would be even better, right? As one goes up, the the the, the other one goes down, and vice versa. Uh, on average, I still get the, the same thing, but uh, I get helped out by the covariance. Now, of course, you know, as with anything in life, right? It's not so easy to estimate and calculate all these all these quantities, uh, and the market is uh, itself rather rather smart. And so it, it, you know, in some sense, it's not easy to find things that uh, that are uncorrelated. But uh, that would be the, the the basic math behind why you would want to diversify. Okay, uh, quickly, let me just do an example with tortoise and hare. Uh, I need to know the covariance between tortoise and hare, so I'm telling you that minus one. I need to know. Uh, you know, 50-50 on tortoise and hare. And the, the insight is, is that if I look at a portfolio of the two, uh, if I get tortoise selling half of my cars and hare selling half of my cars, <clears throat> nothing will happen with the mean. Remember, we said that uh, one of the, if I go back here, uh, this top equation here, diversifying doesn't uh, doesn't really affect your mean. It just, it just helps your, it helps reduce risk. And that in turn will help you uh, in terms of how things will compound. So nothing will happen to the to the mean. I'll still get my on average one and a half cars sold, but I can get a lot a lot less variance because of that negative correlation term. But of course, in in, in practice, you know, I have to estimate these these covariances, and it's not not a simple thing to do. Uh, a more serious example. So let's let's, let's do a stock example. Uh, what's an appropriate investment decision for you? Uh, in the last 10 years has been, since about 2010, there's been a big increase in what's known as exchange traded funds. And there's many funds to choose from. And I put in, I put in blue, you have to decide what you like. Uh, and really one of the questions that, that these probability expectation variance calculations can help you is, well, how much should I, how much should I, uh, should I invest a little, a little or a lot, right? And again, we really what we're trying to see here is, how does that expected return risk math work for you? And as with anything uh, in investing, that you know, absolutely no free lunch to any of these things. Uh, you have to take some risk somewhere, but but can you do it in a calculated way that that that, that hopefully hopefully suits you? 
So just to give you some ideas to think about, uh, there's no, just a little bit like Definetti's subjective approach to probability, there's no quote unquote uh, true answer. It you know depends on the individual. But you know, typical types of questions are, you know, how should I cut my money between stocks and bonds? Uh, you know, should it depend on my age? The older you get, should you have uh, less stocks, for example? Uh, and you know, there's over the years, there's certain investment maxims that that people come up with. Uh, SPY would be the index of S and P 500 stocks, uh, so essentially the top 500 stocks. Uh, in the U.S., weighted by market capitalization, so more money would go into Apple, which is the biggest, uh, uh, as you would go down uh, your list. And rather interestingly, so the, these these in these so-called index funds, uh, the market in some sense does the, what's known as the rebalancing for you. If it's a good stock, it goes up and becomes higher weight. You earn more of it. If it's a bad stock, it it uh, goes down and has lower weight. So there's a strange dynamic uh, approach to, to indices. You know, good stocks get, in theory, put into the index like Tesla, uh, and bad stocks get taken out. And TLT is just an index of bonds. So, uh, and you know, for the last 10 years, bonds really don't, don't yield too much. Uh, if I put my money into a bond that's yielding, say, 1%, uh, I'm locking in and guaranteeing 1% for whatever length of uh, duration, as it's called, of the bond. So if I buy a 10-year bond, people like to look at 10-year interest rates. They're around about 1.5% now. Uh, if I buy a 10-year bond, I'm locking in 1.5%. So I know I'll essentially get, what, a dollar and, and, what, 15 cents back in 10 years' time. So, you know, bonds I'm locking in, uh, they're subject to inflation risk if uh, the value of the currency goes down a lot. I don't really want to lock in today uh, my dollar and fifteen. And stocks on the other on the other side of the coin, uh, you know, in theory are more risky. Uh, there's been periods where they've been more risky, less risky, uh, and for that, people people have discussed, people have looked at historical data. And trying to figure out, well, you know, do I get what's known as an equity premium? Uh, how much extra do I get by putting money into stocks over bonds? And then the, the question for the individual is, okay, what's my ratio? Uh, what's my what's my 60, 60, 40 would be one typical ratio. So stocks or bonds, uh, growth versus value, uh, or different different parts of the world, Europe versus China. So all these problems, uh, you can use these tools of probability to try and get to, to try and sort of assess what you think might happen. So let's suppose I want to construct a portfolio. Maybe I put half of my money in X, half of my money in Y. What's going to happen? And the Markowitz approach would be given. So you'd, you'd have to know what the mean and variance characteristics are of those types of investments. Given that, uh, is there an optimal choice of uh, can I can I? somehow uh, can I somehow choose A and B in an optimum way uh, just to show you what's happened in like the last 15 years uh, what's won uh, it turns out growth stocks have beaten value stocks quite handily for a long for a long period but of course if you go back in history uh, there are long periods of value stocks beat growth and vice versa uh, but Clearly, the uh, if you'd put a dollar in fifteen years ago, you basically have close to three dollars now. If you just if you just uh, in some sense mindlessly bought a growth index of uh, of U.S. stocks, you you would have had your money in companies like Microsoft and Google and Facebook and other such things. Whereas value stocks are more, uh, you know, the Exxon's and Chevron's and uh, the more uh, more sort of old school companies. Okay. So in, in the last bit of, uh, of this week's lecture, I want to talk about three uh, distributions, binomial, normal, and, uh, and Poisson. We've already talked about the uh, binomial distribution uh, with a couple of examples. Remember our New England Patriots example. Uh, so let's, uh, let's define it uh, a little bit more precisely. <clears throat> so Bernoulli was a very famous mathematician, essentially in invented the... Uh, uh, the Bernoulli distribution, uh, a 
essentially the random variable that is uh, either one or zero with probability p or one minus p. Uh, if I do that n times and my trials are independent, so I do a sequence of, of, of n trials and I count up the number of successes. So x is a count variable, the number of times that xi uh, is equal to one. Uh, I'm going to get a binomial distribution with parameters n and p. Uh, what's its mean and variance? I can calculate its mean as np, and its variance is np1 minus p. Uh, you'll see this uh, later when we do when we do our statistical formulas for uh, testing for probability. So uh, remember the np1 minus p. Uh, the simple Joe DiMaggio uh, example. Uh, remember Joe DiMaggio has a p hat. Uh, P with a hat meaning an empirical estimate of P, not a given theoretical one. Uh, what would the chance be that he's got that he would get greater than greater than two hits? So either three hits or three three hits or four. <coughs> Plug in to our formula, I get just over ten percent. Uh, something called a Bernoulli process. Uh, so if I thought of these things sequentially. Uh, what's the chance x1 equals 1 and x2 equals equals 1 independence p times p p squared so uh, a Bernoulli process okay let me let me move to the Poisson distribution uh, so I'm very interested in the in the English Premier League uh, like anybody from England uh, and you can also bet on the English Premier League uh, this is from a couple of years ago uh, along the top of bookmakers so Lab Brooks, William Hills, for example, uh, Betfair, an internet site, uh, Paddy Power. Bookmakers will offer odds. And in this year, actually, again, Man City uh, in 2021 are, are, uh, are doing incredibly well. They give you odds on you winning the English Premier League. So there's an odds table. Now, you'd want to try and figure out probability models for sports betting. How do I set? a probability matrix for the outcomes of a game, right? And so I took a couple of years ago, I looked at the historical data set of uh, all games that Chelsea played, and I just plotted a histogram to see what type of a distribution. So how do I predict the outcome? Or more importantly, how do I, how do I make a list of, a list of probabilities of, <coughs> or possible outcomes? Well, there's a very useful distribution called the Parson Distributions Account. Uh, actually, essentially, it's a binomial distribution when n is large and p is small. Uh, so essentially, uh, p is equal to lambda over n, right? So uh, you can think of it as a binomial where p is small uh, and n is large. And again, I'm counting up. So I'm, I'm essentially counting the number of goals scored. So number goals scored for a team and the formula would be e to the minus lambda lambda to the x over x factorial as x goes 0 1 2 3 so lambda would tell me on average what do I think the average number of goals scored for a team and rather interestingly if you can tell me what you believe about the average number of goals that are going to get scored uh, you know, maybe maybe you think it, it's going to be a big victory, and you know, Man City will score on average, you know, two and a half goals. You can then go back in, and you can work out the probabilities of all these combinations. Again, just like the binomial, I can work out its mean and variance. It turns out the person has this property that its mean is equal to its variance. Uh, another such distribution that's an extension would be the negative binomial. Uh, so extra variability. So sometimes when you look at empirical data, the variance is bigger than uh, the mean. <clears throat> Rather than a pass on, you'd maybe use a negative binomial. So uh, again, there's an issue of, you know, what models do you fit uh, to what things? So <clears throat> let me just look at the lambda, uh, or let me just look at an empirical frequency of my Chelsea distribution rate. Goals scored against, uh, goals scored, and you can see what does the Passer model say uh, and what does what does reality say. 
And the Puzzle model is not exact, but it's a pretty good approximation to the truth. So, as with all probability models, uh, there's always like a diagnostic uh, stage where you check to see, okay, uh, does it does it fit or not fit? And so, given uh, your probability model, given your lambdas, you can calculate very uh, very easily what's the odds that one team will win, what's the odds of a draw, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, for example. Uh, in R, uh, suppose I gave you two teams, one on average that was going to score 0.6 of a goal, one on average that was going to score 1.4 goals. I can just use simple simulation. So, again, another very useful uh, application of probability is just simulation. Uh, simulate out, you know, a hundred or or a thousand or ten thousand times, and just count. <clears throat> Sum up the number of times that y is bigger than x divided by your simulation uh, level. And so you can work out what's the probability team two wins or there's a draw. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's just go a little bit further. You know, how would you how do you get to these lambdas? Well, for each team, uh, there's a paper by David Spiegelhalter. Uh, who's a, a famous uh, statistician at, at Cambridge. So if you uh, Google David's name, uh, you can you can read his approach. Uh, Stuart Coles and Jonathan Torn uh, and Mark Dixon. So the other the other people that have worked on these problems, uh, Coles and Dixon, for example. So you can find plenty online of fitting Poisson distributions to to these data. Uh, so. Uh, given, given a team, you'll find an attack strength and a defense weakness. So, for example, I'm going to do a little example of Man United against, uh, against Hull. And let's see what happens. Uh, so, the average number of away goals, uh, about 1.5 or 1.47. Uh, if I go to Man United and I go, okay, what's its attack strength? And if I go to Hull, what's its defense weakness? 1.37. So if I put it all together, uh, if Man United is playing away at Hull, uh, I would get an average number of goals given by average times attack strength times defense weakness. So I'm expecting Man United to score uh, 2.95 goals and Hull uh, just quickly do that one again, Hull 0.85, Man United that year had a, had a really good defence, 0.52. I'm not really expecting Hull to score many goals. And again, I just do a little simulation table. I only, do, I only fill it in with 100, but I easily fill it in with, with 10,000. And you can see, you know, most of the time, half of the time, you don't expect Hull to score at all. And, you know, the most likely value for, for Man United is, is, is going to be a 2-0 result, for example. And what's nice is that from this uh, from this simulation matrix, I can work out a probability matrix, <clears throat> and the bookmakers provide you with odds of every single possible combination of scores before the game begins. So, uh, and you know, underlying that, you know, difficult for a human being to fill in every single box of the uh, of the matrix. Uh, relatively easy to build these statistical models that estimate what the what the lambdas are, and simulation then gives you gives you the answer. Uh, if you read the paper, uh, uh, a model is really only as good as its predictions. Uh, famous, famous old quote. Uh, and if you read the Davis Spiegel paper, you can you can see how how well that model does. Pretty pretty well. Okay, one more one more quick <coughs> uh, betting example. Uh, I tend to like uh, betting and gambling examples. Uh, uh, one other interesting, and it's a statistical uh, idea, is uh, suppose I really did have, I'd built one of these models that would make me money betting at the, at the EPL, which, uh, which you can do. Uh, you might want to know, am I doing better than just charts? So the blue line would be uh, as, my, as, my, as my wealth would grow. And if you click on the link beneath, uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can read about that. Uh, the red curves are just what would happen by charts. So one interesting uh, you know, statistical question is, 
am I doing better than pure chance? Remember that anything that's got randomness involved in it, uh, I really have to have a, have a baseline of, you know, am I, am I really smarter than chance? And of course, in this example, you are. And the way you measure that is by how many standard deviations you are away from chance. Uh, so, so have a quick read of the article. Uh, they talk. They talk a little bit about uh, about bookies uh, and markets. Uh, another 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 big uh, another big topic. Okay, so we've done binomial and we've done Poisson. They're, they're two discrete random variables. They take values zero, one, two, three discrete values. What about continuous random variables? Can take any can take any value. And so, you know, an age old stock market question is, you know, what will the returns be on the S P index, the big index fund of of the top five hundred stocks? And if if you know a little about stocks or you're don't don't have much time, uh, you know, in investing a dollar into the S P index over the last uh, hundred years has actually been a very good uh, has actually been a very good low cost, uh, you know, idea to do right. So, how would you model that? Well, here's our friend the normal distribution, the bell curve. Uh, here's the notation I'll use. Big Z will be a normal distribution with mean zero, variance one. Uh, here's just two probability facts to remember. What's the chance that a standard normal lies between minus one and one? Sixty-eight percent of the chance. Between 1.96 and, and uh, minus 1.96, 95% chance. Uh, the quantile function and the probability function for normal uh, is what you'd use in R to calculate these types of things. So, for example, you'll see a plot on the next page. Uh, probability of normal is less than or equal to 2.58, is 99.5, etc. And again, if you wanted to use simulation to simulate from a normal, uh, you'd use the, you'd use the uh, the function R norm. Uh, let's go to a general normal. So you'll see me use this notation. So Z will be a, a normal with mean zero and variance one. Uh, in general, if I have mean mu and variance sigma squared, and you know you've you've no doubt uh, seen this before, the chance X lies between two point five eight standard deviations of its mean is ninety five percent. It's sorry, it's 99, the chance it lies within 1.96 is 95. Okay, and there it is, there it is in words. Uh, again, sort of two statistical facts, just to keep in the back of your mind. Remember that, uh, you know, probability is there to help us deal with uncertainty and understand uncertainty. <clears throat> we measure things with random variables, and so we know things are going to move, uh, and the future will be, uh, will be some form of outcome. You want to get some kind of idea of, how extreme those outcomes can be. And so once you tell me the mean mu and standard deviation of a random variable, I've got some sense of, of magnitudes of these moves. Uh, a cute little mathematical fact, uh, how do I standardize a normal? If I start with x as normal mu sigma squared, <clears throat> I just take off its mean and divide by a standard deviation would get me to a standard normal zero one. Uh, in R, we'll essentially use the probability norm uh, command to calculate these things. Uh, pictorially, how does it look? So there's our standard normal bell-shaped curve for Z. And a lot of statistics will be calculating what's known as tail areas. So there's my red lower tail area. The lower tail area of 10%, if I want to put 10% of my probability here, what's my Z score? That's here on the on the on the z-axis. It's minus one point two eight. Uh, if I want to put five, so that's ten percent of my area here. Uh, if I want to put five percent of my area here, what's my z-score that does that for me? Uh, it's essentially one point six four. So calculating probabilities under a normal curve, uh, or seeing how many standard deviations am I away from from a from a mean. Uh, a quick, a quick one-page example. Uh, I remember the 1987 crash. Uh, in one day, the, uh, uh, the the index went down 21 percent. Uh, you know how many standard deviations was that? Was that move? And finance <coughs> has has been full of these extreme, uh, sometimes black swan type type events that uh, are impossible or very hard to see ahead of time. 
Uh, and again, in order to do that, I need some form of probability model to compare things to. Uh, historically, stocks have made on average about 1.2% a month. Uh, one thing to know about stocks is they're much more volatile than that average that you get. So uh, a monthly volatility of 4.3% uh, of is quite large. And think in terms of mean plus or minus 1.96 standard deviations, you shouldn't be surprised in a month to see the stock market go up 10% or down 10%. That would be uh, at your extreme limits. What about this crash? Uh, I get to observe uh, a drop of minus 21.7. So relative to my monthly model, uh, essentially that's a five standard deviation event uh, in the negative direction. And as I said, stocks have this, uh, stock returns are not normally distributed. They tend to have much heavier tails and they tend to drop uh, much faster and quicker than uh, as they go up. So uh, you can have large, uh, large moves. Okay, one more, uh, we've come to the end of probability. Just one more fun example, uh, just to uh, just to finish today. Uh, the next, uh, uh, the next lecture will be uh, on Bayes rule. Uh, so it's a very famous problem. Uh, probability in decision making. It's called the secretary <coughs> or matching or marriage problem. Uh, so you see items or, or spouses uh, from some distribution f of x and the interesting mathematical uh, fact here. So Tom Ferguson is the person that worked on this uh, is that the solution is invariant to this choice of distribution f which is rather interesting. Uh, you'd like to pick the maximum. Well, uh, I want to try and maximize the probability of picking the best. And in the 1950s, uh, one of my favorite mathematicians, so I guess quickly my favorite mathematicians would be von Neumann, Shannon, and Bellman. Uh, Bellman talked about uh, this something called the Bellman principle of optimality. Uh, how do I uh, how do I pick the uh, pick the best from this sequence of types? Oh, by the way, after you just decide no, you can't go back and select. So, uh, so there's a trade off in this problem. <clears throat> so you'll see spouses one a year. Say, uh, suppose you start at eighteen and uh, and stop at sixty two on the next slide. <clears throat> so you've got a, a long period. Uh, Clearly, you, you might want to wait, right? If you pick the first at 18, you're missing out on the, on the future possibilities from, from 19 onwards. So, uh, and rather interestingly, uh, this probability and optimal decision making or theory that Bellman sort of came up with, uh, there's, there's, there's a rather amusing example. Uh, you should wait one upon E along, along the uh, sequence. So uh, E is one of those magic numbers after pi e is 2.71828 so you should essentially wait about one third of the way along the sequence uh, and so there's an interesting uh, interesting set of, of problems that take how do I make decisions under uncertainty uh, and so I want to optimize something I want to maximize the probability of picking the best uh, I've got some some uh, assumptions up top uh, and Bellman has a, has a way of solving for these things. You should wait one upon E along the sequence. Uh, so here's my here's my rule for the secretary problem. Uh, suppose you get married between 18 and 30. Uh, I've got to wait one upon E uh, along the uh, along the sequence. 32. Uh, then pick the next best person. Okay. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, next week we'll talk about base rule.